Hello, I'm author and publisher Mark David Welsh and welcome to my latest review of what I've been reading during lockdown. And this week, things have taken a decidedly spooky turn as we explore one of my favourite literary genres. Yes, it's the weird, the romantic, the fantastical and supernatural in this week's Lockdown Reads Gothic Edition. The Phantom Ship is an 1839 gothic seafaring romance written by Frederick Marriott, and that's where we're starting today. Now, the novel is based around the legend of the Flying Dutchman, and if you're not familiar with the folklore, the legend tells of a ghostly sailing ship commanded by a Captain Van der Decken, who is cursed to sail the seven seas forever after blaspheming against God and murdering one of his crew. Only it doesn't. Not really. The original legend is simply that of a ghost ship, a generic tale familiar to all mariners in days gone by. All the specific details were added by literary and cultural interpretations subsequent to an anonymous short story about the legend published in Blackwood's magazine in 1821. The name Flying Dutchman probably only became attached to the myth because of a real-life 17th century Dutch sailor called Bernard Folk, whose voyages to the East Indies and back were accomplished so quickly that he was rumoured to be in league with the devil. It was this 1821 story that first identified the cursed sea captain as Van der Decken, a name which literally means of the decks, and it also placed the action in a specific location for the first time, the Cape of Good Hope. There were a surprisingly large number of other literary interpretations over the next few years, including Marriott's novel, whose major contribution to the legend is giving Van de Decken the home port of Tenuzen in the Netherlands, an association which has now become a recognised part of the Flying Dutchman tradition. So what about the romantic elements that we associate with the tale today? The fact that Van der Decken can only set foot on shore once every seven years and his curse can only be broken by the love of a good and faithful woman. Well, they're generally thought to have first been mentioned in a passing fashion within a satirical novel by Heinrich Hein, which was published in 1833, although they became forever cemented as the accepted Flying Dutchman law in the public consciousness by Richard Wagner's opera The Flying Dutchman, which was first performed in 1843. So you can see from Marriott, writing earlier, the legend was pretty much a blank canvas on which he could hang a story. Now, his version centres on Van der Decken's son, Philip, who only becomes aware of his father's dreadful fate after his mother's death. Believing that he can redeem his father and break the curse by handing him a holy relic, he sets out on a series of voyages to find the legendary ghost ship, rising through the ranks of the Dutch East India Company as he goes to eventually captain his own vessel. Now these voyages follow a quickly established pattern in the novel. Philip ships out, sees the Dutchman on the high seas, and then his own ship gets wrecked shortly afterwards. But each time he survives and returns home to his beautiful young wife. Now these voyages comprise roughly the first two thirds of the book, now, Marriott was a real-life naval officer who captained several ships and in fact invented a form of flag signalling which was in common use for many years. So he does bring a lot of insider knowledge and authenticity to the scenes on board and the events throughout the voyages. However, the narrative does become somewhat repetitious until the final third of the book when the story takes a very different and rather curious turn. You see, Philip's beautiful young wife, Amine, is of mixed race, having an Arabian mother and a Dutch father. Now, there are scenes early on in the book where a local priest attempts to convert her to Christianity, and it seems like a passing subplot, but it takes centre stage in the book's final chapters. You see, Amine accompanies Philip on his last ill-fated expedition, and the two become separated when his ship is inevitably wrecked. Somewhat improbably, back on land, she meets the priest again, who tries to convert her again. When she refuses, he denounces her to the local inquisition for practising witchcraft, and she is then condemned to burn at the stake. This development does allow Marriott to talk religion, but its message does seem a little muddled. 
On the one hand, he denounces the barbarities of the Inquisition in no uncertain terms and makes it clear that their operational motives were always financial, not spiritual. And he does seem to advocate religious tolerance across faiths as well. Amine eventually rejects Christianity, not because she doesn't agree with its core beliefs, she does, but because she sees alleged devout Christians failing to practice them. It's a very enlightened viewpoint from Marriott. However, he undercuts it all by having Amine actually practice the dark arts. Sure, she's not doing so from any malicious motive, but it does make her technically guilty by the laws of the Inquisition, however wrong-headed and unreasonable those laws are. Now, given the time when the book was written, perhaps he had to include that caveat to avoid upsetting the religious establishment. What's all that got to do with the Flying Dutchman, you're probably asking? Um, well, not a lot, really. There's also a very odd chapter toward the end of the book, when Philip's best friend tells him a story of his personal experience of the supernatural, which involves a werewolf. It's a section that has been lifted wholesale out of the novel from time to time over the years and published as a standalone short story, which is how it reads. It provides no significant illumination on the character of the storyteller and serves no point in the plot whatsoever. The inevitable conclusion is that Marriott came in short in length and had to pad his tail out at the last minute. And the presence of this section merely confirms the impression that the novel was very poorly planned and that Marriott did not have the time or maybe the inclination to go back and fix what are some very significant issues. Now the book has often been criticised for being stiff and awkward in style, but I have to give the author a pass on that one. Yeah, the dialogue between Amine and Philip is ridiculously formal for a married couple, but the maritime scenes are vividly realised, and perhaps with more of a coherent plot and a clearer focus, this could have been a very good and enjoyable reading experience. However, it is fair to say that it did become a little bit of a chore to get through in the end, and I won't be trying any more of Marriott's work. By the way, as a sidebar, did you know that back in the days of sail, right up to the 20th century, very few sailors could actually swim? Yep. It's true, strange as it may sound to us now. Why? Because there was no point in learning how. You see, there was no rescue equipment if you were swept into the sea, no life belts or jackets, or any way for the crew remaining on board to reach you in time. And what's more, they wouldn't bother trying anyway. Because if it happened to you, well, that was God's will, and not to be challenged. So you might as well just drown quickly rather than prolong the agony. Now, if you've been watching my previous Reading Roundup videos, you might be familiar with my thoughts on H. Ryder Haggard's She, A History of Adventure, and the fact that I was seriously unimpressed with this classic. However, I am going to be reviewing a lot of the major film adaptations for my cult cinema blog, and as some of them apparently contain elements from all four novels in the series, I decided to plough on and read the others. Now, the second in the series, Aisha, The Return of She, was published in 1905, almost 20 years after the original novel. Now, it may have been that Ryder Haggard had become a better author in the two decades since. After all, he had written over 20 novels in the meantime. Or it could have been instead that the fact that literary styles had changed. But whichever it was, this is that rare thing, a sequel that's better than the original. The tale is narrated again by ageing academic Holly, who has spent the intervening years since the events of the first novel searching for She Who Must Be Obeyed, accompanied by Leo, his adopted son who is also the alleged reincarnation of Aisha's lost love. Their search has taken them all across the globe, and finally to the mountains of Tibet, where they take refuge in a monastery and hear of an inaccessible mountain of fire and the strange cult who live there commanded by an ageing priestess. 
Convinced that they have found Aisha again, the pair endure many hardships to reach the mountain, including detention by the people of the valley, who have a history of armed conflict with this mysterious priesthood. Now, these valley people are ruled by a dissolute king, but also by his beautiful queen, who is convinced that Leo is her long-lost soulmate and will do anything to possess him. So let's review the novel's good points. Firstly, there is far more action and plot than in the original. Not that that would be too hard. Um, and gone is the endless repetitious speechifying, particularly from Aisha, which severely tried my patience the first time. Ryder Haggard also expands her character in some interesting ways. Her future plans include world domination, simply because she is the most qualified person to run things. But her knowledge and her vastly extended lifespan are the result of an apparent deal with the devil or some equivalent entity. Ryder Haggard does have his cake and eat it a little here because we never really find out too many specifics. But the metaphysical aspect is unusual and quite pleasing. On the other hand, he never really solves the problem of Leo. Yes, he's the handsome type and he gets to do more heroic things here than he did in the first book, but he still fails to leap off the page as a fully formed character. We learn that he's not happy with Aisha's plans for the future and doesn't really want to rule the world by her side, but he never does anything about it. We also suspect that he'd much rather be with another woman, particularly Ustain from the first novel, but he seems literally hypnotised by Aisha's beauty and therefore has little or no free will of his own. So ultimately he is a very passive hero and that does not make for a particularly engaging leading man. And there's another major thing. Holly and Leo go on a long journey. They barely survive. When they reach Aisha's kingdom, Leo is badly ill, on the point of death in fact, but is nursed back to health by a beautiful young woman. She feels they belong together because she is the reincarnation of Amantaras, Callicrates' lover in ancient Egypt, and therefore is Aisha's rival for Leo's love. Which book am I describing? Is it the first one, or this one? Well, it's both, because there are many times when it seems like this is just a rewrite rather than a sequel. Yes, it's a better version, but it's still fundamentally exactly the same story. Now apparently, this is where Leo and Holly's story ends. The other two books in the series are prequels, one a crossover with the Alan Quatermain series. And I'll be trying those over the coming months. Finally, we come to The Witches of Kiev and Other Gothic Tales, the selected works of Oris Somov. Now, Somov was a Ukrainian author of the early 1800s who was fascinated by the supernatural folklore and traditions of his homeland. And this is a collection of six such folk tales in what is rather a slim volume, which contains probably only around 60 to 70 pages of his work. It was not a costly purchase by any means, but I was still expecting something a little more substantial. So, what are the stories like? That's the important thing. Well, they are mostly simple dramatizations of familiar folk tales, some little more than incidents rather than full blown narratives. Now, the most fully realized is the title story, which tells the tale of a young husband whose wife is still entangled in the supernatural practices and life of witchery, which she has inherited from her mother. What was most interesting to me about this volume is how familiar all these stories felt. Folklore is truly an international language, and it's a constant source of amazement to me how many common themes and specific instances crop up in different cultures and regions. The Witches of Kiev tale, for example, has pretty close equivalents in stories from other parts of Europe, Spain, the Lysaka Mountains in Poland, and the Hartz Mountains in northern Germany, which coincidentally is the setting of the werewolf interlude in The Phantom Ship. Now this fact probably only confirms that people used to travel a great deal more in past centuries than perhaps we think that they did. I know that there were individuals who actually made their living by going from village to village and town to town, literally spreading the news. 
and obviously fantastical and supernatural tales preying on local superstitions were part of their stock in trade. And if stories were relocated to more local areas, they gained more credibility than something that had allegedly happened thousands of miles away in another country. And obviously the better the telling, the better the pay. So I found this book more interesting from a historical perspective than as an entertainment. I was also rather irritated by the annotation system in the book. Now obviously when you're reading something this old, which has references to an unfamiliar culture, there are bound to be many terms you don't understand or for which you need a little bit of clarification. The publishers here have provided that at the back of the book, but in a slightly strange and rather inconvenient format. There are both endnotes and a glossary, which sounds fine and would be if it wasn't for the fact that more than half of the endnotes simply refer you to the glossary. Why not just combine the two into one? Or better still, have the annotations at the bottom of the page concerned rather than having the reader turn to the back of the book multiple times. So I was hoping for a little bit more than I got here. I mean, a historical account of Ukrainian folktales is of interest to me, but I was expecting this to be a volume of fictional tales with characters and story development. Kudos to Somov for preserving the traditional tales of his native land, with very important work, but not so much for presenting them as works of fiction. Well, that brings us to the end of the first Gothic edition of my reading roundups, but I don't think it'll be the last. I mean, I've read a lot of 19th century and older fiction in my life, and it has certain qualities that you just don't get anywhere else, and that I love as part of the reading experience, even if the examples I've talked about today are obviously not destined to land among my favourites. Well, that's it for today. If you've enjoyed the video, please like, share and subscribe by using the buttons down below and join me in the comments if you'd like to have a conversation about anything that we've been discussing. And in the meantime, please stay safe, stay well and don't be a stranger.